Christ is risen. One of the neat experiences that my wife and I have had is working in world missions is to see how different cultures handle different things. And you gotta like the culture in Eastern Europe or in Africa in their openness to express their faith. In Ukraine, for example, for three or four weeks after Easter, when you walk down the street, everybody simply greets you, Christus vos crest. And you're supposed to answer, Voistino vos crest. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Perhaps the most fascinating example I saw of how the people are willing to express their faith in some of these cultures is when I was teaching in Nigeria. Uh, the professor and I were leaving at the big international airport in the capital of Nigeria. Uh, we were wearing our clerical collars because we were told that makes it a little bit easier to get through some of the checkpoints and whatever. Uh, and as we were going through that security check, uh, right as we were at standing in front of a, that x-ray machine that was going to make sure we weren't carrying something we shouldn't be, two of the guards in full uniform stepped in front of us, stopped us from going through, stopped the line, fell down on their knees, and asked us to bless them. Uh, again, kind of wish we, in our culture maybe, were a little more open in being able to express our faith. But today we rejoice, and we express the joy of that faith in a risen Savior. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Opening hymn, I know that my Redeemer lives. It's hymn 441.
Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. I will not die but live, and will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord's right hand is majestic in power. The Lord's right hand has shattered the enemy. In greatness of his majesty, he threw down those who opposed him. Death has been swallowed up in victory. The Lord will not abandon me to the grave. He has made known to me the path of life. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I, and not another. How my heart yearns within me. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. For it is the Lamb who is slain to receive power and love and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and grace. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen. Even in our Easter joy, we confess before our gracious God our failings and sin. Lord God, we acknowledge and confess that we have sinned and that our lives are not always what they should be. We have acted as if you are not alive and present. Our sin leads to guilt that destroys our joy. Our self-centeredness leaves us feeling empty and alone without the peace you won for us. So often we have failed to be faithful witnesses of our living and reigning Savior. Forgive us, Lord, for the sake of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. As a called and ordained servant of the Christ, and by his authority, I joyfully announce to you the forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We pray, Almighty God, by the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, you conquered death and opened the gate to eternal life. Grant that we who have been raised with him through baptism may walk in the newness of life and ever rejoice in the hope of sharing his glory through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be praised now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. We sing, He is a risen glorious word, 461.
pray? O Lord God, our strength and our salvation, in your mercy you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to lay down his life to rescue us, the lost. Then, by raising him from death, you gave conclusive proof that he successfully carried out that rescue mission. Through the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, you have planted in us the joy of our salvation. On this festive day, we come before you with happy hearts to sing your praises and shout, Alleluia! Thanks be to God! Amen. The Lord be with you. Our first scripture reading comes from the book of Job. The book of Job in the Old Testament is probably the oldest book in the Bible, written before the time of Abraham. And we can see how clearly the hope of the resurrection rests on the resurrection of a Savior, a Messiah. Oh, that my words were recorded, that they were written on a scroll, that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead or engraved in rock forever. I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. The word of the Lord. We're going to sing Psalm 118. You'll find it in the front part of the hymnal. The organist will play through the refrain and play through the song tones. Then we'll kind of pause and hold the note and then we begin our singing.
Our second reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That entire chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, is a resurrection chapter. I suggest that you find some time and read the thing in its entirety sometime today. We read, If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. The word of the Lord. We sing, He's risen, He's risen, hymn 445. attention on the stone before Jesus' tomb. 
Part 1. A tombstone for a, a dead Messiah. We read from Mark. It was preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of the rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Vividly etched in my memory of the two times that my wife and I visited Israel is the garden tomb. The garden tomb is a sacred site just outside the walls of the old city of Jerusalem. Now, nobody says that it's the tomb of Jesus. There's no way to prove that. But it is a tomb that goes back to the time of Christ and gives us kind of an idea of what Jesus' tomb might have looked like. It's carved into the side of a mountain. And when you look in there, there's a small room, and on the side are shelves where the bodies would be placed. The garden tomb has four shelves, two on each side. What's most remarkable about the garden tomb, however, is the door. The doorway to that tomb is five feet high. And in front of the doorway is a track where the stone that closed the door would have been. And this track is 12 inches wide. And it has a retaining wall six inches or so. And the track runs downhill and is blocked at the end. So when you move that stone in front of the tomb, well, gravity would help to seal it and hold it in place. Imagine how big that stone must have been. You know, at least five feet tall, at least 12 inches thick, carved just to fit the entrance. Well, some kind of a stone like that blocked the entry to Jesus' tomb. And it was a monument to a dead Messiah. The people of Israel had been looking for Messiah for, for generations, for literally for thousands of years. It went back to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden when God promised that he was going to send someone. Someone who would crush the devil's head. Somebody who would set them free from that captivity that they had to sin and death. And then it was passed on from generation to generation, especially through the prophets. The prophets who gave increasing details about the Savior to come. And then Jesus is born. Comes into Israel and he says, I'm that Messiah. The Greek word is Christ. I'm the Messiah. I'm the Christ. And thousands of people start following him. They were so excited. They had been waiting and waiting for generations. And now had come that deliverer who was going to drive off the Romans and make Israel a great nation once again. But pretty soon they became disillusioned. It became clear that that was not the kind of Messiah that Christ was. He had no interest in establishing some kind of a worldly political kingdom. In fact, he said the opposite. He said that they should respect and obey the governing authorities. Respect and obey even those conquering Romans because God had put them there and the powers that be had been ordained by God. Most of the people walked back away again. But there were a few, a few who still hoped, who still followed, still believed that this was the Messiah. He convinced them by his miracles. He convinced them by his powerful, authoritative preaching. And they still hoped. But now their hopes were dashed too. 
He had been executed, killed, and now he lay dead in a tomb. As the women went to that tomb on Easter morning, they expected to find a dead Messiah to pay their last respects. And what they and all the others missed was that that death of the Messiah was part of God's plan. Part of the plan that had been clearly stated all the way along in Scripture. The Bible said the wages of sin is death. Sin deserves death. That's the punishment. Scripture said, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Christ appeared once for all to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. He was delivered over to death for our sins. The scripture says, no man can redeem the life of another or give to God a ransom for him. The ransom for life is costly. But since no man could make a ransom payment, God said he would do it himself. God sent his son to this world to be that ransom for us, to go to that cross to make the payment in full for our sin and guilt. In Rembrandt's painting of the raising of the cross, in the crowd of people who are helping to crucify Jesus, there's one man who's got a blue beret, a painter's beret. Rembrandt has painted himself into the picture, confessing that he too, and it was his sins, that helped to put Christ on that cross. In the movie, The Passion of the Christ, Mel Gibson was the one who held the nail that was driven into the hands of Christ in that movie. It was his way of saying that it was his sin also that put Christ on that cross. And it's your sins and mine that put him on that cross. We sing, Oh, perfect love, life of love. It's hymn 431. And we're going to sing verses 1, 2, and then 4 and 5. <clears throat> stone before Christ's tomb, a monument for a victorious deliverer. We read Mark. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they ask each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. 
you are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. When the majority of people in this world gather to worship, they gather to revere and pay their respects to dead religious leaders. Buddha is dead. Confucius is dead. Muhammad is dead. Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormons, is dead. Charles Russell, Joseph Rutherford, founders of the Jehovah Witness, are dead. Most people, when they gather, they gather and worship, or at least pay their respects to leaders who were dead. But a dead Messiah can't do you any good. A dead Messiah, in the end, would have fallen victim to Satan's hold over us all. A dead Messiah would have been shown to be a lunatic, a liar, a fool, because he had said over and over and over, on the third day I will rise again. But as they approached that tomb, the women thought that that's exactly what they would find, a dead Messiah. But the tomb was open. And they really should have known that would be the case. The Bible had been very, very clear. King David, a thousand years earlier, had written, You will not abandon your Messiah to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. Isaiah, 700 years before, had made it very clear that this Messiah was going to die. No question about it. Isaiah wrote, he was cut off from the land of the living. He was assigned a grave with the wicked. But, Messiah, but Isaiah doesn't stop there. He goes on. He will rise. He will be lifted up and highly exalted. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life. Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils of victory with the strong. They should have known, but they fully expected to find a dead Messiah. And it almost seems like the angels were, were really shocked about that. The angels give their announcement, Why are you seeking the living among the dead? It was really the same saying, you should know better. You should know that he would not be here. He said he would rise again on the third day. You should have expected. What, what are you doing? You don't find the living inside dead men's graves. We know how that works, don't we? We've, we're looking for something that we've lost. We go to the place we expect to find it, and it's not there. We go to a second likely spot. It's not there. And we go to a third, and it's not there. And then kind of starting to panic, we go back. We go back to the first one and look again, and to the second one, to the third one. And how irritating it is when we, we find out that somebody moved it to a different place. And at least at my age, most likely it was me. That, that moved it. But the truth is clearly illustrated. You won't find something if you're looking for it in the wrong place. You won't find the Messiah if you're looking for him in a dead man's grave. Because he rose exactly as he said he would. One of the symbols for Easter is a broken chain. Christ has broken that chain, that chain of, of death that held all mankind, that, that chain of sin and guilt that doomed us. He's broken free. He's walked out of that grave with a promise that because I live, he says, you will live also. We sing him 455, Alleluia, Jesus lives. <laughs>
stone before Jesus' tomb. The foundation stone for the church. We read from Mark. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him and who were mourning and weeping. When they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they did not believe it. Afterwards, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking in the country. These returned and reported it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later, Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. If God wanted to give a definitive sign that Jesus was successful, what if he had simply opened up heaven and in a loud voice yelled out, Amen! Amen is just the Greek word taken over into English that means this is true. This is real. What if he had done that? Well, first of all, some people would wonder whether they really heard it or not. Others who didn't happen to hear it would deny that it really happened. And so God found a better way. A way to give conclusive proof that Jesus had succeeded in this rescue mission that he came to earth for. An empty tomb. And in that empty tomb, the burial clothes, undisturbed, but the body gone. Conclusive proof. Anybody could have gone to that tomb and could have seen that it was empty. And no one could produce the body. 2,000 years later, still, no one has ever produced the corpse of Jesus Christ because he is alive. But that wouldn't really do any good if nobody knew about it. And so did you notice in the scripture readings how much the emphasis is always go and tell. In each case, they're told, go and tell what you now have seen. He's risen. Go tell his disciples and Peter. The angels speak to the women. Then we're told that they ran to tell the news to his disciples. Mary Magdalene sees the Lord. And the scripture says, Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The two disciples on the way to Emmaus had had a nice long walk already when Jesus appeared to them and they recognized him. And it tells us they got up immediately and returned at once to Jerusalem. Then the two told what had happened. And then when Jesus appeared to the dis disciples in that upper room, Thomas wasn't there. And as soon as they could, they told Thomas, we have seen the Lord. And if you read in the book of Acts, after Jesus' ascension, you look at the sermons. Every one of those sermons comes back and focuses on the resurrection. Our Christian faith is founded on the fact that our Savior rose again from the dead as proof that we now have been justified in the eyes of God, as proof that God has accepted the payment and the sacrifice that he made for us, as proof that we too will rise. But did you notice what was the reaction when those eyewitnesses gave their report? In every single case, the first reaction was they didn't believe it. I guess it shouldn't surprise us when we give our testimony. And often it is met with, with disbelief or with doubt. But that's not our problem. God says to us, you are my witnesses. 
He doesn't say, you're my attorneys, you're my defense counsel, you're my debate champion. He says, you're my witness. What's a witness do in a trial? All they ask him to do is to, to tell what he sees, saw, to tell what he knows. Just, just tell what you know. We're his witnesses. We can tell of the peace and joy we have because we know we have a living Savior. We can tell that even death doesn't fear us because our Savior has gone to prepare a place for us and has promised to come back and take us there when the time is right. We can tell him that we have a purpose in our life. Our whole life is lived to give glory to him. And we do it by reflecting his love to those around us. We can pass on the Bible's invitation, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you too will be saved. God gives us that privilege of being his witnesses, to testify to what we know is true in our lives. And leave it up to the Holy Spirit, whether that's going to take root or not in the person we're speaking to. We spoke about 1 Corinthians 15, being in the, the resurrection chapter, and in this whole chapter, he goes through great detail about the witnesses who saw Jesus, about what it means that Jesus is now alive, about how the last enemy to be destroyed is death, how we're going to be changed, that the perishable must put on the imperishable, the mortal puts on the immortal, and so forth. We're going to be changed when Jesus comes back for us. And then he ends with this concluding encouragement. He says, Therefore, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Amen. It's true. Now, if you'll open up your worship folder on what would be page 9, except there's no page numbers, on the bottom you'll see the confession of faith as we confess now our faith in our risen Lord Jesus. This is the gospel on which you have taken your stand. This is the gospel by which you are saved. This is the gospel we must share with our world. I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and was born of the Virgin Mary, I believe that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. As the resurrected one, Christ Jesus is my living hope. Now he reigns as king and will come again to judge us all on the basis of the faith in him alone, which the Holy Spirit has planted in us. This is the saving faith that lives in me. Amen. And we go on now to the Easter prayer, which spoken responsively. Heavenly Father, God of grace, you have brought us into a new and living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We marvel at the love you showed by your willingness to sacrifice your son to pay for our sins. We bow down in adoration at your mighty power which raised him from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and raised to life for our justification. Lord Jesus, God of grace, you have filled our hearts with resurrection joy by your victory over sin, death, and the grave. Dear Savior, we who are weary and burdened come to you for rest, knowing that because of your perfect redemption there is now no condemnation for us. Holy Spirit, God of grace, you have called us by the gospel and brought us to saving faith in our risen Lord. Keep us with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. As we journey through life, make us yearn for the day when we will give eternal life to us and all believers in Christ. 
Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Work through us and our congregation as we proclaim the saving message of the crucified and risen Jesus so that many others may hear your call, obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus, and join us before the throne of our God and of the Lamb. Hallelujah. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The blessing comes from Hebrews. It talks about that special comfort and encouragement we have in the risen Savior. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good, that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Go, brothers and sisters, in the joy of forgiveness and the resurrection. The Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord God. A closing hymn, Jesus Christ is risen today, 438.
Thank you for being in worship with us today. Happy Easter to all of you. Easter really deserves more than one Sunday. And since we had so many things canceled by the weather, we're going to celebrate Easter again next Sunday. So we're going to try again on the Easter brunch next Sunday. Uh, also, uh, the Easter egg hunt, we're going to try again on that next Sunday. Uh, and if I happen to miss one of your favorite Easter songs, well, there's a chance we'll get to that one next Sunday also. <laughs> so, certainly invite you to be back again, of course, every week. Also, some of the refreshments are still down there in the fellowship hall. If you want to take a few minutes to sit down with the family or friends and visit, uh, please do so. The Lord bless your celebration. Goodbye.